Welcome, family, to episode 19 of the Big Money No Problem Talk Podcast Show, man. We get straight into the point, man. I'm Chuck, a.k.a. Big Will, with my brother from another AG, a.k.a. Mr. Ileana Jones. We want to let y'all know, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We want to let y'all know, man, that Big Money No Problem Talk Podcast Show was sponsored by Bill Hub Media, Profound Entertainment, where they have a selection of new artists and gamers, such as Reese Bones, who new album The Gemini is streaming everywhere right now. So go check that out. Also, remember to check us out on the, the Big Money No Problems Talk Podcast Show over those internet airways. You'll be able to check us out on the One United Radio Station, which you will be able to stream at oneunitedradio.com, or you can download the One United Radio app. Also, you'll be able to check us out every other Saturday from 5 to 6 on the number one base internet radio station out of Houston, Texas, which is the 92KELZ radio station, which can be streamed live at 92KELZ.com, or you can download the 92KELZ app to tune in. So continue, continue to support the big money, no problems, ENT family, and be on the lookout for more moves to be made to further this platform and to continue to give our listeners what they want to hear. So stay tuned in. So as I always say, man, welcome again and again and again, 19 times over to the Big Money No Problem Talk mm-hmm. podcast, straight into the point conversation, man. We got a, we got a good one tonight, man. AG, go ahead and introduce our family tonight. What's up, fam? <clears throat> Today we got Frederick Deshaun Murphy. You know, me and, me and Deshaun go way back. TSU Big Blue, you know what I mean? Tennessee hey, State sir. Tiger, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Alumni, you know what I mean? <laughs> Hey, this is a good brother right here. You know, what I mean? he's been hustling hard, grinding hard on this on this movement. Uh, he has the movement, you know, the history before us has uh, such projects as the other side of the coin, race generations and reconciliation, and the award winning uh, documentary, The American South as We Know It. So, you know, everybody, want to welcome Deshaun onto the show. We appreciate having him. You know, what I mean, we appreciate his movement and his hustle. Hey, I appreciate y'all, man. You know, and this it's one of those things in which I try to encourage individuals all all the time that we so much stronger like this versus like this, you know what I'm saying? And oh yeah, the time this was the only way. And then, you know, when integration happened, things started going this way and that way and this way and that way and this way and that way. <laughs> so now I really feel exactly. like right now we're starting to kind of gel back together and understand that we're we're such a, a more powerful force together versus being separated. So I appreciate y'all appreciate y'all for having me on the show. Oh man, it's love, man. Yes, sir. It's love. All it's love. day, all day. I man. think that, that, day. that appreciation goes both ways, bro. Exactly. Exactly. So as we always say, man, do what you gotta do to buy about what it's doing this episode tonight, man. And let's get straight into the point. Let's do it. Yeah, you, already, you already know. So as AG said, man, we got Sean Frederick, Deshaun Murphy, uh, the history before us project, head man doing this thing, man, just kind of let the people know, you know what I'm saying, your movement and your upbringing. Yeah, so, uh, man, was uh, actually I was raised, I was born in Illinois, uh, Danville, Illinois, uh, which is not too far from uh, Champaign-Urbana. Uh, right. Lived there for four years, and then we moved back to Tennessee. My family left Tennessee because my great-grandfather, they were sharecroppers, and okay. they would sharecrop for like five families in a year and would never get ahead. So, um, and my grandfather had, it was like, it was like, it was 14 of them. So my grandmother had, you know, she had 13 siblings <laughs> and uh, fortunately enough, we got nine of them that are still alive. You know, they up in oh, the eighties, wow. uh, some of them there in Illinois and, and some of them came back to Tennessee. So, um, we went back to Tennessee when I was four years old so my grandmother had, you know, and that's kind of like where I was able to you know, understand my family history and get more of my family history during that, that standpoint and, and ask the question, well, why did y'all leave Tennessee? Um, to Illinois. But the thing is, it was the migration. You know, there was multiple migrations of black folks at the South heading up to the Midwest. You know what I'm saying? There's not nobody in the Midwest that you can talk to that does not have ties back down South. <laughs> I mean, right, just right, 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 right. <laughs> so as much, and even on the East Coast. So like everybody. I was about to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. East Coast too. And in the West Coast too, everywhere, right? So I mean, that's that's where we, that's where we came from. A- absolutely. So, yeah. um, so they left out because grandpa kept getting gypped. He kept getting gypped, kept getting gypped. They went up there for, for something that was better. And unfortunately, it, it, it did not turn out to be that way uh, with regards to, to things becoming better. And I'm getting to my history before this point. Um, in, uh, I think it was 67, 66, I can't remember exactly when, uh, I had a grandfather, I had my uncle, which is my grandmother's brother. Uh, he was found hanging behind my great grandmother's house, right? Oh. So they left Tennessee 
<laughs> to Illinois for better situations. And then that mm-hmm. incident, that, that happened, right? Not an incident. Um, the story behind that is my, my uncle was dating a white girl and mm-hmm. her uncle had something, to, he was high up in the, in the police department. So mm-hmm. um, they went out. They went oh, to that's, a, that's, a, that's a bad situation. Yeah, bad situation. That's a bad, bad situation. situation. <laughs> Church came home. Um, he didn't come home. All the rest of the folks did. All the rest of the kids did, or what have you. They found him on that Monday morning, about forty yards behind my great grandmother's house, which was a whole bunch of uh, trees and stuff. They found him hanging. So grandmother, they they brought him in the house. Um, his siblings, his uncles, um, brought him in the house. You know, just kept him in the house. Didn't even call the police immediately uh, because they knew what it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the police finally got there, they automatically named it a suicide. They didn't do any type oh, of wow. investigation. The coroner automatically called it a suicide. No investigation. Didn't didn't question anybody. Nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when I got that information back in Tennessee, um, that's kind of what sparked my interest in all this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Oh. Like, well, damn. If if that happened mm. to us, how many other families and stuff like that did this happen to? And um, facts. But one of the other things is, though, that specific generation, and I think to a certain degree, it was out of protecting us when they would, you know, tell you to go, grown folks talking, et cetera, et cetera, right? Right. Like, get out the room. But it was so many nuggets that they were dropping in the room that we needed to actually hear and we needed to be there to understand it. So I wouldn't necessarily always leave. I'm like around the corner listening out for surnames, listening out for all this other stuff that was going on because there was so many of them and I loved all of them. You know, I, I had the opportunity to meet my great great grandmother. You know what I'm saying? So it was really deep for exactly. me. Um, so right. that kind of sparked the whole history before us thing because I started doing my own family genealogy and and, and things like that. And then, and then, of course, growing up in the 70s and the 80s, our very first hit uh, with regards to seeing the racism uh, blatantly was um, uh, Brother Rodney King. And, and yeah. it was at 92, 93. And I seen that. Yeah. <laughs> this is how they really, this is how I really get down, you know? You say it, 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 it all kind of tied in and made sense. Like, yeah, you know, this, this is real. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it it made everything because when you think of lynching, for me and our generation growing up, you know, you would never think that you would see something like that, right? You, you hear the stories or what have you, but when it's in your own family, it hits a little bit different. Now, granted, yeah, no one ever served a day of jail, no one ever went to trial, none of that stuff. So we still don't know the specifics around it. However, we do know a narrative that did that was around it. But then when you look at situations like George Floyd, we, we, we pretty much saw a lynch. That, that, uh, that, that, that <laughs> administrative, leave, uh, administrative leave has been here, you know what I mean, for the ages and ages. Ages right? and ages. So <laughs> that's our lynching, right? Like right. we still right. seeing these lynches or what happened. Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So history before us spawned from um, family history. It spawned from just becoming more well-versed on the civil rights movement, the institution of slavery, um, Reconstruction, um, uh, different uh, the amendments, you know, all, all these different things uh, is, is what kind of spawned uh, history before us. And I'm just a big oral history guy. I think the history, oral history is so important. You know what I'm saying? I'm always telling people, if you got grandparents, great aunts, great grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, you have to glean everything that you can from them so you can understand who sits, who stands in front of the mirror on a daily basis? You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and that's right. just that's just huge. We got to keep doing that. That's tradition for us. That's African tradition. And that's what I tell that's people right. a lot, man. You know, your 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 past kind of depicts you. You yeah. know what I mean? You can't you, know, you can't live and dwell in the past, but you have to be you know what I mean aware. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Have to be aware of the past to you know what I mean to really understand what your your present circumstances are. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Even to 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 go off into the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's 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 mandatory, man, and and that's kind of like what started, uh, you know, again, history before us. It originally started as an oral history project, and I traveled throughout the South, um, interviewing individuals about Jim Crow, and then I kid you not, so I was living in Asheville at the time. I, I'm mm-hmm. in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, but I I took a, I did a short stint up in Asheville, up in the mountains, beautiful, and I kid you not, you know how sometimes ancestors speak to you, right? And um, I, I'm in the bed, and I'm getting ready for my my next, the day of the day of work the next day, and I'm and I just got in my head because I had just watched some documentaries. I'm like, damn, I mean, somebody got to keep this thing going. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So I, I, 
and this and I had already done the oral history project at this time, but I'm like, well, who's really listening to oral history anymore? Like, you know, I mean, I, I'll listen to it, like, but I'd rather see the visual. Yeah, I got to. And yeah, everybody with their visuals now, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the that's the age, right? We pick up our phones, we mm -hmm. you know, I mean that's right. just what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kid you not, man, something just spoke to me and just said, um, you gotta do more. We've done more, so you gotta do more. So that next day, went to Best Buy, bought a camera. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not that good at this. So I'm going to reach out to one of the former <laughs> students that I knew because I was the director of counseling at Johnson C. Smith University. Shout out to JCSU, another HBCU down here in Charlotte. And I got the very first yeah. um, student to graduate from the film program. And from there, he from Maryland. And I'm like, yo, how deep in the South have you been? He was like, this is it. And I'm like, well, we're about to go a little bit further. <laughs> 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 so we hit up Mississippi. We hit up Alabama. Um, I mean, we, we went all throughout the South, outside of, uh, you know, the Southwest. We went all throughout the Southeast, interviewing mm -hmm. individuals about their specified experiences during Jim Crow, and we put them on camera, and that's how the American South, as we know it, came about. And I was, cause I, I was following a lot of it, man, and it was just like, you know what I mean, seeing some, like you said, visuals, you know what I'm saying, seeing some of the images that, uh, that you were displaying, man, like, I can only imagine, you know what I mean, it had to be some type of uh, emotion, you know what I mean, just just being in them areas, talking to, you know what I mean, the various people and, you know what I mean, hearing the stories like, so, so like, what, what did you feel? You know what I mean? Man, it was, it was, and I'm a therapist. I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical uh, counsel, you know, counselor, mm -hmm. you know, a mental health therapist. Exactly. And, um, man, I tell you, that was very emotional um, because to go and sit with individuals who had to endure so much and and mm. to be present, right? Like to not have your mm. cell phone in the way, like not to have nothing but them sitting in front of you and seeing the pain. Uh, mm. More important, the resilience that they had um, and, right. and have is, it's, it's a feeling that you can't describe. You know what I'm saying? It's indescribable. Exactly. But some of the stories that are given to you, man, like uh, Sister of Free, yeah, we, can do, we can do this. She's down in Selma, Alabama. <clears throat> and her mom had to get out of uh, out of uh, Alabama and get to Chicago because she uh, was she skipped the line in front of a white person in Selma and they threatened her. So you you can't mm -hmm. do that in the fifties, <laughs> in the forties. No. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so they they had to get to Chicago, exactly. right? They they had to they had to get to Chicago, and that's 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 where they did. And so she came back. And she um, came back to her, her roots down in Selma. And we were sitting there and we were talking and she, she's in the center um, that's right there on the banks, right by the, uh, the, the, the Pettus Bridge. And this specific building mm -hmm. is, is where the uh, enslaved mulatto women were being held uh, when the slave ships came up. So downtown uh, Selma, Alabama, man, there's a, mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of rich history that's there. Um, so while we were in there, she was telling me this story and she showed me the stuff and she's like, some of the cruelty uh, uh, that was going on back then is, is you just wouldn't imagine. And she said, I just sit here sometimes and I just look at it and sometimes I just cry. And I'm like, you know, well, tell me what's mm -hmm. the, the deepest thing. And it was this one specific scenario where an enslaver and the neighbor in the neighbor enslavers, um, there was a, a enslaved woman that was given birth and it was, it was a C-section they, they cut her stomach open. When the baby came out, they made bets on how long it would take once she was sewn up for a kitten to, to claw through the stitches for it to get out. Oh, wow. It's, it's, yeah, real talk. And these were, type of, these were the type of things that they would do to our bodies, our persons, you know what I'm saying? And make money mm -hmm. off of it. These were, this was a bet and this was written on this specific plantation. It was in the, in the log books, books. So none of this stuff is stuff that you can't find. You just got to research it. You know what I'm right. saying? And I sat there exactly. and started tearing up exactly. over it. Yeah, absolutely. And so she was telling the story and I'm sitting there and I'm just, I'm starting to tear up and I'm just like, damn, like she's already enslaved. She had the baby. She's still open. You put a kitten in her while she's open. You sew her up and the bet is to see how fast the kitten can get out. And that was just one of many things that I had access to reading while in there. So very emotional, man. And then on the flip side of that, 
uh, like I interviewed Sister Hortense McClinton, and she was the very first uh, African American faculty member to um, to teach at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And then when you hear her story of how her father was was ran out of Texas because they threatened to kill him um, over a, a business, something, something, something with some business, and they had to leave and go to Oklahoma, Boley, Oklahoma, which is a historically black uh, black uh, settlement. Um, but then she goes on mm-hmm. to be who she is. You know what I'm saying? So. Again, it's an emotional roller coaster, man. It's an emotional roller coaster. It is. I can only imagine. It is. It is. And that's and, and that's kind of crazy. Like just to kind of get back to what you were talking about in terms of being able to talk to your elders when you talk about your great greats and everything like that. Cause in this generation, a lot of the kids don't get that opportunity to be able to have those conversations with their elders. Cause I just had I heard a similar story from my uh, grandmother who's 76. So mm-hmm. she lived through a lot of the stuff that went on and she's in North Carolina. So she understands the South movement and everything and how that stuff was moving. Yeah. And she told me a story about something similar to that, the way a woman who was pregnant and they messed around and literally cut the baby out of her stomach yep. just to steal the baby. Like it's stories like that, that goes on within our culture. And it's kind of, so, how, so what's your thought process when you hear these stories and with the projects that you're moving and then you hear today about, Nah, we shouldn't talk about that. We need to just continue to move on with certain parts of our history, but don't worry, don't talk about the negative stuff like history. When I feel like you can't get a grasp of the United States of America if you don't talk about it. Exactly. So what's your opinion on that? Man, <clears throat> you you pretty much got people walking the plank. If 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 you don't want to allow them to see what from a comprehensive point of view has been uh, occurring in uh, our culture, in our lives, in our history, then you got people walking around here blind and and they living in the fallacy. You know what I'm saying? Like there is, they're living in a completely different universe because if you're not exposed to those different things, then you wouldn't be able to understand right now why the government's down there supposedly, and I believe it, uh, with uh, some of the, de- the, the uh, immigrant detainees um, sterilizing them, doing hysterectomies. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like this ain't nothing new. Like it, it, it's it's nothing new. This this is the stuff that's been going on forever. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's it's um, weird, man, because I was I was watching uh, a documentary. And it was like uh, with the Native American uh, Native Americans how they were uh, practicing the sterilization in 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 the Native American <clears throat> communities or whatnot. You know what I mean? But it's it with it seems like with our community, it's like I said, you have to dig deep to research. It's not easy to find. You know what I'm saying? Everything is still so so uh minimized and 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 hidden almost. You see what I'm saying? Well, and you gotta think about how intentional that is though, right? Like that's that's the whitewashing of everything. Right. <laughs> like that's, that's, <laughs> that's I the- mean that's that's man, like that's part of the ultimate goal is to make sure that all of these things are pushed so far back to where um, you don't think about them. Right. right. And, and, and in this country, you know, you, when you hear, especially the, with the, with the acts of the, 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 the current, you know what I mean? The, the, that are happening presently, you know what right, I'm saying? Right. Cause if, if, if it's out there, then you can tie it back and say, you know what I mean? Then you can right, righteously call it systemic. Sure. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and it's, so, so you know, back to the question, if you do that, then you're doing people a disservice, period, point blank. I would want to know it all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. I wouldn't want to know that just right now that these cell phones uh, have always been here. Like, what came before that? <laughs> it was big. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, exactly. And we had right. to pay for each minute. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What those unlimited plans? <laughs> like, I want to see a, a, a dollar a minute, free after nine. <laughs> <laughs> big block phones. Right. Right, here. right. Yeah. You know, I want to see the evolution of it because if you expect to evolve as a person, you have to know that other aspects of life had to evolve as well. You know what I'm saying? Right. Nothing just came yeah, out the way right. that it is. So yeah, I, I think that right. that if you don't show things from a comprehensive point of view, bro, that 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 you you leading the blind leading the blind at that point. I know it just had to be like a total life changing moment. You know what I mean? With your uh, your travels through the South, I man. I just know that had to be just you know what I mean? Uh, just a pivotal, you know what I'm saying? Eye opener. 
Yeah, man, because the thing is, everybody has, everybody thinks the South is, is, is monolithic, that everything is just the same in the South. And it's not. Different it's regions not. have different things. Even when you talk about, like, present day music, Texas music is different, right? Uh huh. Yep. Memphis music is different. Atlanta music different. Yeah. Yep. Atlanta music different, right? Like those elements just don't show up. Florida music is different. It don't that those elements just don't show up in um, present day, but in the past, that's how things showed up as well. It was different everywhere you go. So when I go to when I went to places like, because I was always curious on why uh, Martin Luther King was in Alabama and Mississippi so much, like all the, the you know the great civil rights leaders, and like, granted they went all throughout yeah. the South. But the way that they organized in Mississippi and Alabama with regards to funneling black folks out the South, as well as, um, you know, putting together the, the, the freedom rides and all these other things and, and, and literally creating safe spaces for folks as best as they could. Um, those specific places were just a little bit different. North Carolina was different. South Carolina was different. You know, you have different cultures exactly. in all these uh -huh. different places. You know what I'm exactly. saying? So. Like, for instance, I went to Mound Bayou, Mississippi, and I interviewed Brother uh, Herman Johnson at a Mound Bayou, Mississippi. Uh, and, uh, and he was the successor of Mega Evers, um, of course, uh, Brother Mega Evers, who was gunned down in his driveway, uh, right. at the insurance company that he had worked at. <clears throat> and he would tell me that whenever Mississippians, Black Mississippians were in trouble, they would come to this specific space, and he, he showed it to me uh, while we were filming, and he said, in two days, whoever was in this building would end up in Chicago and wouldn't be in trouble anymore. He wouldn't go any deeper than that, right? But right. it was kind of like an underground railroad thing that they were doing, uh, funneling people to safety, right? And right. just how there were sundown towns in a lot of different white, uh, predominantly white communities for black folks. And of course, sundown towns mean you better be in the house before the sun comes down. Yeah, you don't know what's going to go down. Right. Hey, hey, hence the, exactly. hence the uh, be in the house when the street lights come on. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, uh, which was a historically black town, uh, right outside of Alcorn State is, is right there. Um, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters would be armed to the teeth in the perimeter of the towns um, and white folks couldn't come in. So mm -hmm. they they took the power back, right? Y'all can have your sundown mm -hmm. towns, but this is a, a, a predominantly historically, this is a, a historically a black town and we set the parameters with regards to what happens mm -hmm. here. And every one of those, um, that town was founded by the former uh, enslaved individuals of Jefferson Davis's brother, and Jefferson Davis is a force. Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederate Army. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's how Mound Bayou got started. You know what I'm saying? So, and they were armed to the teeth. You couldn't come in unless someone vouched for you. You couldn't come in, and and you had to get escorted out before sundown. So we reversed the game. And 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 it was crazy because hearing those stories and what you're alluding to, like I grew up in, uh, uh, I was born in North Carolina. I grew up in uh, Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. So growing up in that era, like late 80s, 90s, and when you think about what you're talking about in terms of learning the history and having these conversations, it was so different whenever I would go to the South yeah. compared to with me growing up where I was growing up and going to school. Because I tell people, a lot of people don't believe me. I've met people in the South who never knew about the Black National Anthem. I knew mm -hmm. a lot of people in the South who never even heard of those things. And so... When they would talk to me and be like, I said, I learned that in third grade in my in my elementary school. But mm -hmm. up north, we look at and we learn things and that culture is a conversation. Yeah. And it's so uh -huh. and me being in Texas right now, when I'm talking to my kids and hey, what y'all learning about black history? What y'all learning about this, that, and the other? Uh nothing. Martin Luther right. King, that's all we talking right. about. You know what I'm saying? Your typicals, and then it kind of worries me a little bit because it's like we kind of getting away from the true essence of our culture and our history and our younger generation of kids, it's almost seeming like they kind of get into that mindset where I don't, I don't why are we talking about that? We're not there no more. We're not with, I'm like, these are the conversations. That's why I like what you're moving and what you're doing in terms of kind of bringing that enlightenment to, mm -hmm. hey, this is what it is. The deep South is the deep South and they call it that for a reason. Yeah. Like it, it ain't, it is. It, it's, 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 it's totally different. Like you said, it's different across the uh, board. But yep. the South is the South. 
And it's still laws, and you got to still move a certain way, even to this day and age. Yeah. When you go down there, so you get down, kinda, you you get down there, get to driving through and see some of them Confederate flags. Yeah, it's real lightly. You know what I'm saying? So how? So in so in your in your in your explorations when you was going down there doing your uh, research and your mm-hmm. documentaries, did you ever encounter like certain situations where some of them folks was looking at you like, ah, you shouldn't be talking about that around here? Or yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, bro, right outside of, uh, well, actually about, I think it was a, uh, a town right outside of Jasper, Alabama, which was a small, smaller, smaller town, and I'll never forget it, uh, because when I, when, when I travel, I also do these little quick snippets to where I ask somebody, can you give me 60 seconds and tell me why history is important? Mm-hmm. Well, we pulled up to this gas station, uh, me and my camera guy, we pulled up to this gas station, middle of nowhere, absolute mm-hmm. middle of nowhere and um, go inside the gas station. Outside of it were these three white guys in, um, in overall snuff, you know, your typical, mm-hmm. quote unquote, redneck, redneck, if you will. And this back on chewing and spit. Back, yeah, that, it, exactly, had to, yeah. uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was a sister that was working the register on the inside, and she looked like she was probably like 50 years old. And I said, hey, um, you know, I'm from out of town, we filling up. But I do this segment and I ask individuals, um, uh, you know, if they like history and if they do, why is history important, right? Just to keep the momentum going for, for individuals that, are, that follow my page and stuff like that on various different um, aspects on why people feel history is important. So she said, yeah, I don't mind doing it at all. I said, cool. You know, she rang me up. We came out and my camera guy gets the camera. The three white guys stood up. And I forgot what her name was. I did. I, I actually did a little blog about it. And I said, um, OK, well, ma'am, this is you know what I'm going to ask you. So one of the guys came up and said, what are you doing? He was talking to the lady. And she said, well, I'm just doing this thing right here. He steps in front of her, moves her back with his arm and says, she don't want to be in front of the camera and we don't either. So I said, well, sir, I didn't ask you. I asked her. Bro, when I tell you her, she, she looks so dejected. And her head was straight to the ground. And um, while we, while, while the guys were standing there, the guy behind them, he kept trying to like move his shirt to the side because I know he was holding something. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's just I mean, in the middle right, of nowhere, right. in this big little town or what have you. And I, I said, well, sister, I said, are you sure you don't want to participate in this? Are you going to allow him to speak for you? And bro, she turned around and she went back into the um, went back into the to the store and, and kept working. So I told the guys, you know. Okay, well, you know, y'all have a good day, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we wasn't finna start nothing down there. We ain't from there. You know what I'm saying? We on a mission. <laughs> My camera guy ain't been to the South like that. And I didn't want his experiences to be, you know, to where I ain't rolling with you, Fred. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, right. Uh, even though I wasn't, you know, necessarily um, not privy to that, you know, just growing up in the South, living in Tennessee, living in Louisiana, living in Georgia, living in North Carolina. You know, I've been all throughout the South, living in certain places. So um, that was an incident. Um, and it was just other ones throughout the South to where you see people looking at you strange, South Carolina, North Carolina, you know what I'm saying? Rural areas like that. Uh-huh. But, and, you know, we try to just follow the code. You know what I'm saying? It's not that you, you're scared, but you got to be cognizant. That's what I'm right. saying. Cognizant in a way. Yeah. You, you just, you just got to be because you, you can still end up missing. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And that's just. You, you're dealing with, you're dealing with people that have the worst form of malice. Absolutely. In their heart. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's not even it's not even you. It's just the color of your skin. It's your, you know what I mean? It's the way it's your your persona, it's your image, it's the but, way you look. You know? Yeah. But what's scary, but what's scary about that is you got that form of malice of us and our culture and our generation from that side, but we still get that same form of malice from our own in certain communities that we try to go to as well. So it's kind of it's kind of uh, like you don't see it's on both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. And like just even you telling that conversation, uh, telling that story, it's almost like this is the, the mid 2000s people like it's still stuff like this going on in 2000s. Like this is it's 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 it's, it's scary because like I said, I've been to Mississippi yeah. and I hit it and I hit a certain places you got to be what be aware of certain places, you know, they still hold on. They were still having I did some research on one of our shows where 
they would still have the segregated proms all the way up to 2014-15. Yes. In the South. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that's got to yeah. be crazy. Like, yeah. <laughs> Cle- Cleveland, Cleveland County, Mississippi, which is right next to Mount Bayou, they just uh, eradicated the segregation law with regards to that school district. Really? I mean, like, See, I know. I, I think that my was family it. came from uh, came from uh, Yazoo, uh, yeah, Yazoo, Yazoo City. City. Yeah, Yazoo City in Jackson. Look, see, they're south. Yeah, I've been to Yazzie City and I've been to Jackson too. Yeah, so um, so it, it, it's it's one of those things, man, to where um, you know, unfortunately, still uh, as black folks, we, we have to be cognizant, and um, you know, where you stop, you know, uh, do you? I always go into a, a a place and purchase something if I got to use a restroom on the road. And it's just, and I may not have to, you know, I may not want to buy anything, but I'm just like, just to not have just it, because. Had it, let me just yeah. go. And I always carry like maybe $15 cash with me so I can just maybe go buy a little pack of gum or something like that. Uh-huh. Just so I can have the cash on me when I go to some of these rural areas. Cause you just don't, you just don't know how things are going to present itself specifically in the, in the, in the era in which we're in right now with, uh, 45 being uh, at the helm that makes it even even more tricky <laughs> <laughs> so how would you how do you feel like you know as far as through your travels and what you've seen you know what i mean how do you do you how do you how do you feel like it relates to us and our community now present day um you know what um so and it, it's it's tricky, man, because so many of our communities have been ravaged by gentrification. Um, mm-hmm. Some of it has just been ravaged by poverty that's been there just forever, like so long standing, right? And for me, with my travels with the American South, as we know it, and I'll get into the other film in it shortly, it was, it was literally like, well, damn, if you're a Black person, and you still here today, and you came from a long line of survivors. Wow. Because everything that our ancestors had to endure for us to be here today, wow. and I mean, bruh, I mean, so even <laughs> in those poverty stricken situations, it's still a sense of, 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 of pride because who else would be able to do it than us? Who else would be able to? You know, you got seven items in the fridge and you, you can make a full plate. Like, you you, you know what I'm saying? You put your right, color right. skills together, you make that thing stretch. You know what I'm saying? Well, so like, that, uh, like that Facebook meme, you know, you got you got $10 and you got to feed your family. <laughs> right. I mean, what you, what you going to make? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, so so it's bad as, as, as uh, for some people, when they look at some of our situations, it'd be like, well, you know, um, they're super duper poor. They're this and that, this and that, this and that, this and that. You know, we we adapt and we learn how to to um, uh, we learn how to make a way. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And trap my travels throughout the South, um, seeing that in some of these rural towns and seeing black folks sitting on the porch laughing, kids out on dirt roads playing kickball and stuff like that. That was very reminiscent of what my childhood was growing up in rural Tennessee exactly. rural at the time. Uh, now, right. Clark's is a whole lot, you know, it's bigger now. Um, but um, that's what we was doing, you know what I'm saying? And eating the bologna sandwiches, eating sar- um, <laughs> a, a, a canned, uh, golly, one of my fried bologna, fried bologna, yeah, yeah, fried bologna. Yeah, yeah. Fried bologna. put the little mm-hmm. X in the middle so it don't or, or, or the band-aid sandwiches, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we still surviving, we still got it, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. So, mm-hmm. so for me, it was really a sense of pride to see going throughout these various different communities that we still we still know how to do that. In, in spite of all the other things that are that are, are, are happening in our community, whether it's drug use, whether it's, it's you know uh, the unfortunate killings and things like that, uh, you know we still making a way. It may not always look pretty, but we doing it. And that's the thing, man. Like you know, I think we all need to realize, you know, what I mean, like you said earlier, you know, what I'm saying the resilience. You know, what I mean, it, it it wasn't even it wasn't just our our predecessors, our ancestors. You know. Still, currently in this day and time, now we are still, you know, what I mean, black equals strength. You know, what I mean, we are very, uh, a very resilient people. You know, what I mean, that's why. But a lot of us don't really understand 
our resilience. You know what I mean? We think of it as, all right, we just don't keep grinding. We just don't keep grinding. You know what I mean? But we're not really understanding where that came from. You know what I mean? We, hey, we take a, take a lick and keep on going. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's the way that we, we, we've had to be throughout centuries. You see what I'm saying? But that's the importance of the research. That's why we, more of us should research our history. Yes. To understand why we are like that. You know what I mean? Not even just for the, the racism aspect, but you know what I mean? Why we are as strong as we are. Yes. And you, you know, know um, and you know, obviously, um, so this is one of the gripes that I have now as an adult versus when I was um, younger in school, because you don't think about it, you're trying to kick it and do everything else. But I really believe even because I, I, AG, I know you may not know this, but after TSU, I went to, also went to Bethune Cookman. And I went and got a master's at Bethune Cookman. So that in itself is a nice rich history as well. You know, of course, with Sister uh, uh, Yeah, I did know. Bethune, yeah, right. Um, uh, with Sister uh, Bethune. Um, so um, I really wish that it's implemented in these uh, specifically HBCUs that history mm. is implemented all throughout your tenure in school, uh-huh. whether you're history major or not. Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, there needs to be a course based on history, right? Mandated. Start with the man. Yeah, absolutely. Mandated. Mandated. It starts with the history of the school, and then you move it to the local community, and then you move into a more vast space, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. Because the thing is, we got to have these people staying in these communities, right? Um, when you talk about Nashville, where we was at, TSU, Fisk, and Meharry, all right there. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. Um, right. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things in which we kind of got to get back as the as institutions, predominantly African-American institutions, to where we say, OK, yes, we may be state, man, state mandated to, to, to provide certain things if it's a state school. However, we got to have skin in the game. And these are some things that we want to change so we can make sure that our kids, when they leave here, have a better understanding of who they are and what they're going to face when they go out into the real world. And I, I agree with that because if we do that, you know, what I mean, that would that would give us more uh, more of a push, more uh, more of a uh, backing behind us to start uh, forcing it to be in the the, the elementary, yep. the the junior high schools, yep. the high schools. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I'm saying? To where that 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 is a uh, is I mean that is a, a part of the you know, your your history course. You know what I'm saying? Your your history class. You know what I'm saying? Not just uh, 29 or 30 days. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> Not just exactly. a month of uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it, it it brought it 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 goes it goes so much further. You know? What yeah. I mean? yeah, yeah. You don't. Know, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chuck. Oh no, I was just saying, especially in the South, because HBCUs should be the staple of some of these black communities in the South. Like it should yeah. be a lot of it should be a lot of push for a lot of these kids and a lot of the alumni and everything to come back into a point to where it's like, hey. Let's take care of what's going on within these communities, man. We need we learning from these individuals. So let's let's come back and do what we gotta do to handle business. Cause I see it a lot up in I do like I said, up north is just it's just different. Like being in DC, you see it a lot with Howard University. Yeah. Well, I'm not I come out Howard University is just it's just to say, but people don't understand that HBCUs is more than just HU. Absolutely. It's a lot of it's a lot of other HUs that are real powerful <laughs> and traditionals that people don't really talk about or know about. So I feel like in the South, definitely that needs to be a statement when it comes to our community. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. Yeah, it's, 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 it's no doubt about that, man. And, and then, you know, just trying, and I love what's happening right now with regards to some of these athletes choosing HBCUs as well. Exactly. Know? Exactly. Uh, I saw a tweet earlier, and then it was taken away, that my homeboy from Memphis sent, Saying that uh, Deion Sanders is the head coach of Jackson State. Did y'all see that? I didn't deleted. see it. Yeah, it was deleted, so I don't know if it was legitimate or not. But he did send that to me, and it says tweet mm-hmm. no longer available. So I don't know what happened with that. But I, I'm loving seeing people because y'all remember back in the '90s, in the '80s, when yeah. everyone would wear HBCU apparel. You know, you watch right, 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 right. Well, you know, so <laughs> I'm glad to see that people are starting to push things back that way you know even hearing Chris Paul say that you know he, he would have went to an HBCU like a lot of these people are starting to recognize it but I think that to a certain degree even maybe even us to a certain degree when you look at the, the past generations and what is taught with regards to how you're going to be successful 
all of that was predicated based on what that previous experience was for that generation, right? So mm-hmm. when I look at things like from my mom's generation, my mom is 60, she's 66. So from what she saw in the past, it was the destruction of neighborhoods. It was the destruction uh-huh. of businesses. You know, it's the Black Wall Streets that are being torn down, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. So, and, and, and it's the lack of, of, of opportunity to get loans and houses, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So from that generation, the ones that say, well, you're going to go to college. You're going to go to college. Boom, 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 boom. When you look at what it is that they possibly could have compared it to in our generation, 70s, 80s, et cetera, et cetera, that, that, that stronghold of having things on lock economically for those communities that weren't there anymore. But if we talk about a generation in the exactly. 40s and the 50s and then up into the 60s, you could see how the economic prowess in the black dollar would stay circulating in our communities. But when, right. when, when your own country comes through and blows it up and destroys it, <laughs> and, and leaves no trace of it. it. <laughs> and, and, and and it's quite discouraging, you know what I mean? Like yeah, and we, we talk about, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, let's 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 uh reenact, let's recreate Black Wall Street. You know what I mean? And I, I can it's I, I see it from two different sides. Like, yeah, we should, yeah, let's let's uh let's invest, let's 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 do this. But at the same point in time, you also know in the back of your mind that just the same way you was wiped out before, it can be wiped out again. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's it's kind of a discouraging uh feeling. That people have because you don't know whether you should, <clears throat> but or you should. I think in this, but I think in this generation today, when we talk about uh, trying to reenact something like the Black Wall Street, it's about keeping like uh, like what you were talking about. It's about keeping that dollar circulating within the community. The problem that we see today compared to what was going on back in the day, of course, we was forced out during yeah. that moment in time when that happened. Today, we letting these folks come in, give you the best top selling dollar that you can have, and then you quickly take it and then you move. Don't you yeah. Be doing, yeah, you yeah. shouldn't be doing that. So we basically sometimes, in a way, gentrifying ourselves by putting ourselves in positions to where we just totally like, you know what? I got to come up. So because I got to come it's up. It's because the dollar, the dollar value is more. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, supersedes cultural value now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Everything yeah. is everything is money. That's why you know what I mean. In my opinion, that's why you know what I mean. It's all everything you see on money uh, on TV on 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 online. It's about money. You know what I mean. It's about you know what I mean. It's it's a, it's a competition. You know what I mean. And the 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 crazy part about it is the competition is only central. You know what I mean. It's, it's centered in one demographic. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. The other cultures aren't 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 in competition with each other the way that we no. are. You know what I'm saying. The no. the flash and the money. You know what I mean. Is thrown out there like that in order to keep us. And that that crab uh, crab in the barrel syndrome. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. And and even when you're looking at these different communities, um, like when you were talking about Howard, you know, it was two years ago when the guy was walking his dog, <laughs> and the dog was using the bathroom on the on the campus, and he was on like, the "Move the campus." He said, "Move yeah, the campus." He said, "Move the campus." I was like, "What?" <laughs> like, what? like, that's how emboldened they are, and then. Is and that not the right. white privilege? Right, right, right. It's exactly. long here. This cap is down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, even when you look at some of our HBCUs, man, they're, they're, the neighborhoods are changing. Tennessee State is nothing like it was. There are $400,000 homes right around the corner from where we went to school. Up here at JCSU, uh, right outside the gates, man, you got homes that are six to $700,000 right outside yeah. the gate, like literally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I worked there for five years. I saw the whole thing happening. Um, Bluefield State, which was originally an HBCU in West Virginia, is predominantly white. Mm-hmm. West Virginia State University in HBCU <laughs> is like 65% white now. You know what I'm saying? So everything is changing within our communities. And if we don't keep the dollar circulating, um, then everything will be taken. <laughs> right, just like we're seeing, and 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 some people call it gentrification, but I call it hostile takeovers because there is an ancestral element to these neighborhoods, right? There is a history mm. to these neighborhoods. It there is, is um, there is a familiarity to these neighborhoods, and when you see black folks that are walking in these predominantly white neighborhoods that are in these downtown areas or, or next to these HBCUs or, or what have you, um, or these predominantly African American neighborhoods that have changed they're not just walking in there to walk in your neighborhood. They're walking in there because that used to be their neighborhood. 
they're walking in there because those were the pathways that they would take when they would go to grandmother's house or, or uncle's house, et cetera, et cetera. And it, just because it looks different doesn't mean that they don't have that footprint in their brain that says, because because it's, you know, it's, it's our brain is a muscle, so it's like a memory to, to, to revisit these places or just to hang around as, as long as possible. But when they're being wiped out, then, you know, it makes it very difficult. And our people get harassed being in these places. Yep. Yeah, and that's why, I, and that's why I say it's important to know your history, especially when it comes to our culture, because as it's, it's been alluded all the time now, we 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 built this country, we helped build this country. We have just as right to move around <laughs> as much as possible as anybody else up here. So, right, so I think sister, that's why. What uh, say? Off our blood, out. sweat, and tears. Yeah, it is for real. Like we <laughs> yeah. did this. Yeah, that was we, we we carried it. We carried the weight of it, the the burden of it. You know what I mean? On our back. You exactly. know what I'm saying? Literally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Literally, and on our back, we carried it. You know what I mean? We built it. We we the the foundation of creating it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The, the, so the, the, the whole blueprint, the the whole economic prowess of this country was built. You know, I mean, we talk about Wall Street. You talk about insurance companies. You talk about banks. All of that stuff was built. We were the original currency. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, in this country, we were the original currency. You know? We were the currency. We were the 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 base of the the barter system. We were the base <laughs> of the trade. You know what I mean? Everything. You know what I'm saying? So everything kind of you know I mean relies and, and and comes back to us. Yeah, and and not only here, but like these things were global exports. So like when when people talk about slavery, um, you know you. Oftentimes people think cotton, but it was, man, it was so much far, far more expansive than cotton, man. I mean, indigo, you talk about rice, you talk about cotton, you talk tobacco. In Tennessee and Clarksville, where I'm from, um, tobacco was one of the big, that city was, gained its riches because the tobacco that they were growing there was, it was called bright leaf tobacco. And then there was this dark leaf tobacco that was there. And it was a really rich soil that was there. Uh, and a lot of uh, colonizers from um, North Carolina and Virginia would come down to Tennessee and Kentucky and they would utilize the enslaved individuals because uh, my ancestors were some of those enslaved individuals that were forced to clear the land and they were cultivating uh, tobacco and they would ship it across the across the globe, man. I'm talking England, I'm talking France, I'm talking across the globe. So these things that we were doing here in the United States, these brothers and sisters that were enslaved, they were sending out things that were large exports across the world. So even when you hear people say, well, we were in Rhode Island and we didn't have any, we didn't have slavery here or this place or that place. Well, let me see the fabric that you're using. <laughs> it had to come from cotton, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Where you get that from? I don't know too many people you know in Rhode Island. <laughs> So you still gave your contribution to the cause, basically. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you know what I mean? It's, it's interesting that you say that, you know what I mean? It was more than a cotton, but the thing is, you know, we can only, you know what I'm saying? We can only speak on and only, you know what I'm saying? Really uh, think about what we're taught, you know what I mean? Yeah. At them young ages, you know yeah. what I'm saying? For for them, them that that one month of the year, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? That's the only thing that we were taught. Okay, yeah. it was cotton fields, you know what I mean? Cotton gin, you know what I'm saying? That's all that we know. That's it. Yeah. It's, so we got to find the strength within ourselves to go back and really, you know what I mean, do our due diligence and research right. further just as, you know I mean, just as well as you did. You, you, for sure. You see? For sure. And, and, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I think that with what's going on right now, I feel like there's a shift. And I think that people are doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I ain't never seen so many people with LLC starting up right now, brothers and sisters, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Loving it, man. Yeah. Food trucks popping up, mm -hmm. you know, soap mm -hmm. shops, candle shops. I mean, people like, all right, you know, we, our backs pushed up against the wall. We recognize that from a pay scale standpoint, things from an equitable standpoint is not there. So I got to do what Gosh. I need to do to make sure that um that I can survive it. And, you know. It's definitely an, an entrepreneurial era. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And we, and, and we are, you know what I mean, doing more efforts and capitalizing yeah. off that. You know what I'm saying? We, we have to remember this is a capitalist country. You know what yeah. I mean? So we need to start, you know what I mean, to, to start or continue capitalizing off of off off of these uh opportunities ourselves as well mandatory brother that yeah. that's, that's that's the only way we're gonna yeah. say exactly and it's nothing it's nothing new like when it comes to our coaching because we've been having to survive in that manner 
for a very, very long time. Because it's always the system always, yeah, the system always been against us. Yeah. So we ain't talk about your uh your award winning documentary, man, the American South as we know. Yeah, so um so the American South as we know it, man. Um again, you know, travel throughout the South interviewing those specific individuals, uh entered multiple different film festivals, uh from Atlanta to Virginia to South Carolina. Uh, one was in London, uh, Texas, uh, the, the Southeast Texas, uh, no, the Northeast Texas Film Festival was down there, um, uh, Tennessee, just various different places. Uh, Mississippi uh, actually um, won one of the uh, best documentary awards in, in uh, Mississippi as well as, um, as uh, North Carolina and Raleigh. Uh, and I was even blessed to screen the documentary. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate that. And I was even blessed to screen the documentary at the state capitol. Uh-huh. And the state capitol was built in 1840, of course, by enslaved individuals. And it was the it was the third film uh, since 1840 that was ever that was ever um, screened in in the state capitol. So okay. that was that was a blessing. You know what I'm saying? That was that was huge. Hey man, they're, they're, hey, those are some amazing accomplishments, bro. Like, yeah, I mean, like for real. I'm, you know I mean, I'm I'm proud to know you as a friend. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and just proud of your achievements, man. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, like, I, like real I, deal. I appreciate it. I, I greatly appreciate it, and then that kind of segues into the next, into the next uh, documentary, which is that's what I was gonna say. Don't speak on that. Yeah, man, definitely the other side of the coin: race, generations, and reconciliation. And um, this one, it kind of came out the blue when it started. I, I knew I was gonna do something on interviewing whites um, because I had to understand that from a humanity standpoint, everyone can't be against us. So I needed to find the folks that weren't. Right. right. Or the first that may have been at one point and then they had a change. Right. So um, I was doing a screening at this spot called the um, Charlotte Hawkins Brown. And she's a, a powerful sister in history. Uh, she bumped elbows with the with the with the women's uh, with with Mary uh, McLeod Bethune. Um, you name it. She was right there with them. Her name is Charlotte Hawkins Brown. And that's somebody definitely that for the listeners. You got to look up Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Uh, dope soul. Dope woman. Did a lot of great things. Um, I was at her historic site screening a documentary, screening the documentary, uh, The American South as We Know It, and a white lady came up to me and she um, she started tearing up and she said, you know, um, watching your documentary reminded me of the things that I would do when I was in school. And she was really shy and I'm like, like, were you the one throwing? <laughs> <laughs> Bob, saying, you know, like, tell, me, tell me exactly what are it you, is. You know what I'm saying? You, hey, is this a regret tear? Right, right. Or is it you? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But she was like, um, she was like, no, I was um I was a picker at uh, UNC uh women's college uh in Greensboro. And um okay. I was like, okay, um, okay, cool, you know, and she was telling me, you know, I had uh, black friends on my hall and none of us were able to, and they weren't able to go into the same stores that we were going into. Oh, and I took yeah. it upon myself to, um, to pick it and do sit-ins and everything else so they can get the same treatment that the whites got. And okay. I was just like, wow, like I said, what if I put a camera in your face? Would you say, would you tell this story? And she was like, I don't know. And I was like, well, I'm begging you. And I, I said, your voice can be very influential. And she says, well, you know, I've never talked about this really uh, since then. Uh-huh. And um, I, um, I said, well, let, let me get your email. I just want to continue introducing myself to you, you know, so maybe we can get familiar. So a month later, I was in her home. Her name is Susan Marshall. And she uh, allowed us to, to film her. And of course, she's in the new documentary. And something that was very powerful in the film was she put out a letter that her father had written her because he didn't necessarily understand it initially. And he wrote her a letter on rules of engagement. Change your hair every time you go out there. Try not to look people in the eye. Try not to listen to their words, et cetera, et cetera. He said, pretty much, I don't understand it, but these are your friends and I'm proud of you for this cause. So from then I was able to seek out other individuals who had the same storyline and it just kind of popped off, It, it, it worked out. I was also able to go into um, Warren County, which is the ancestral land in which my folks were enslaved. And there's a, a Native American tribe there called Halawasaponi. Um, so with the Halawasaponi tribe, I interviewed uh, Brother Matt Silver uh, at their powwow on last year. Um, so, you know, it just, um, 
it just came to, came together beautifully, in my opinion. I was able to get Brother Speech from Arrested Development, the hip hop group, of course, uh, award winning. Oh, sure. And um, um, Speech is on there, and Speech had it tough, man. I mean, y'all hear the song Tennessee, which is a, I love that song. It has it's, it's literally yeah, yeah. It's, old it's, school. It's, it's yeah, old school. Yeah. Yeah. When you really yeah. think about it, it's really spiritual. When you when you sit when you sit down and you listen to all the words of it, it's very it's a very spiritual song. Hey, Arrested Development was just you know what I mean. It was dope, man. It was yeah. different. Yeah, it was different. Yeah, they, For real. they, they real. were different. And he talked yeah. about that, but he talked about his brother because he grew up in Milwaukee and his grandmother lived in Tennessee, West Tennessee. So that's how he came up with the song because that's where his ancestors were from. So, but he would talk about his, how his brother would get beat up often by white folks and he called them greasers, right? Like, because that, uh -huh. was, that was who they were back then and how, you know, blood was coming out of his head often, how they came home one time, swastikas was on their, um, on the, um, the, 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 the house, drawn on the house. All the furniture was taken out of the house and put on top of the house, like just went through it. You know what I'm saying? And um, so he goes deep into that and, you know, just a lot of great people, uh, Brother Joseph McGill with the Slave Dwelling Project, and what he does is he sleeps in former uh, slave dwellings. I'm, I'm actually uh, bored. Um, so what he does is he seeks out slave dwellings that are still behind the big house, right? And our whole mission is, you know, you can't have, you won't, you can't have what's in the front without what, what what's was in the, the back. back. You know right. what I'm saying? Like in the people right. that was in the back. So what right. we do is we go around to existing slave dwellings and we sleep in them. And before you sleep in the slave dwellings, and Joe would tell you that's like a bait and switch. You have a fireside chat and you talk about the legacy of slavery and how it's still impacting us today and how we can move forward or how we can collectively at least have the ideology and understanding that this was something um, when chattel slavery, which was introduced here, um, well, of course, by whites, um, is something that hit way different than indentured servitude or regular slavery, right? You know, oh. chattel slavery was meant that whoever was born to an enslaved mother was going to be enslaved for the rest of their life, <laughs> right? That's what that meant. That's what shadow slavery meant, right? So um, he's in the documentary talking about um, the institution of slavery, of course, and then, of course, uh, what it is that he does by sleeping in existing slave dwellings. And it's a great, I've done two, I've slept in two, and I planned on doing about three or four this year, but of course, COVID hit, so we had to cancel them. But that in itself is a hell of a uh, of an experience, man. Sleeping in a man, bed. keep uh, <clears throat> keep us informed on that, bro. I think that, that that's an adventure that we 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 might want to. You know what I mean? Big money. You know, what I mean? we, we might want to. Uh, yeah. Want to go and, yeah, go, go, and, and join the website that. is slavedwelling.org. So that's what, okay, okay. slavedwelling.org. That's the website. And um, again, it's you sleeping in a slave dwelling. You sleeping in an original slave dwelling. And uh, it's deep. It's deep, man. I mean, I can only imagine what better way oh. to to actually feel, right? That your, you know what I mean. In, your history, your history. Yeah, to, versus putting yourself in that in that in that position, man. Right. And that's what you do. I mean, we stayed, and one of them, I stayed in North Carolina. Uh, Chuck, uh, you you had broke up. What part of North Carolina were you coming back to? When you yeah. Uh, it was Henderson, Henderson, North Carolina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's right. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right next to a. Hold on, hold on. Wait, Henderson I'm about, is. Nah, uh, I'm about forty five minutes outside of. Uh, it's forty five minutes outside of Raleigh. You pass, yeah, yeah, you pass yeah. through Henderson to get to. Raleigh. Oh, yeah, you're right next to Warren County. Yeah, right there in Warren County. Yep, yeah, that's exactly. yeah, that's where. You know what? We had our very first North Carolina family reunion in Warren County back at the plantation in which our, my folks was enslaved in 2019. Wow. I was able to find the owner of the plantation. And um, come to find out, he knew a lot of uh, the individuals with the same last name, last surname as mine, which is Tally. Um, mm -hmm. And um, he allowed us to, uh, you hate to say that, he allowed you to. When, you know, right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> he allowed us to go there and we had the celebration there. You know what I'm saying? Um, but um, so we stayed in uh, at the James K. Polk site, which is here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm a, uh, well, in Pineville, North Carolina. I'm a board member there, too, and um, also in Charleston. Okay. Man, listen, we stayed in Charleston last September. It was about, man, it was 90-some degrees. It was hot. Um, 
there was a there's a pond behind us, like this swamp that was behind us. There were gators back there. Ooh, gators um, and them and them monster mosquitoes, huh? Monster mosquitoes down there in Charleston. Uh, you hear the coyotes, like you're out there. There's no door. Mm. Windows are open. You sleeping in it just like you would have slept in it back in the day. And I mean, we, you get the chills, man, like because it, it could have been back then, it, it could have been 15 people up in there. Mm. You know, we all comfortable because we got space and, and, you know, we in our own little uh, right. bags and everything else. So we got a pillow, we got our space. And at one point in time, I was on my cell phone. We were all kind of on our cell phones. It was like five of us on this one side. And I'm like, y'all, we got to put these cell phones down. Yeah, like, yeah. Real it's just yeah. like, so we all agree. We're like, yeah, we tripping. So put the cell phones down. Part of it was kind of to distract us from hearing the coyotes and, and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> At least for me. Hey, <laughs> hey, I can hey with the doors wide open. Hey, wide right open, man. Hey, hey, hey the coyotes smell some fresh meat. <laughs> and I'm telling you, man. And, uh, and so so being in there and then um they would have to get up from what we were told at like four o'clock, uh, depending, you know, in the summer, you, they would eat and then prepare themselves to get out to the rice fields. Uh, and it was like seven o'clock when I got up after a, a terrible night of sleeping. And I, I got up and I stood up and I walked out to the back of the, of, the, of the slave dwelling and I felt bad. You know what I'm saying? I apologized to the ancestors and I'm like, I should have got up at four o'clock. Uh, I should have set I that alarm you. and I should have got up at four o'clock. Uh, I should have followed every routine to the best of my ability that they had to do, you know what I'm saying, to pay homage. But, you know, it's one of those things to where, you know, if the good Lord blesses me, I'll go back and I'll do it again. And then I'll try to mirror it as much as possible without actually being enslaved. But it's definitely an experience. And yeah, slavedwellingproject.org uh, for everybody that's listening, that's definitely something if you want to, to get back um, if you want, if you want to, to have that experience, um, and you know, some people have various different reasons to which, why they won't go to uh, former plantation sites or what have you. But I'll say this, the spirit of the ancestors appreciate you when you come home. Oh yeah. Period. Think of how many times these, these former cemeteries, these cemeteries that are African-American cemeteries that are all grown up and people think it's neglect. But the fact of the matter is when people had to leave out the South or when people were sold here or sold there, et cetera, et cetera, they didn't have anyone to keep it up. People didn't know where to go. Like, if I ask y'all right now, where's your fourth great grandparent buried at? Hmm. Or fifth? Who knows? Hmm. It's I can go back to my third and my third only. It's I cannot go back farther than that. Yeah, I was about to say, I, yeah. Yeah, I, go back, I go back to my third. Yeah, third. Yeah, that's that's it. about it. Right. Which is, which is crazy because we should know. Yes. We should exactly. know. You know I mean? We should <laughs> exactly. be able to trace our heritage back. But you can't do it. It's too, it's too difficult. It's difficult. You know, when I'm on like Ancestry and I'm looking at people's trees and I see some white folks' trees and they got like 20,000 people on their tree, 7,000 people. I'm looking at mine. I got like 200, 120. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'd be like, damn, y'all That's able to get back to England or Spain? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great difference you know what i mean and it's it's it's, it's sad though man you know what i mean because yeah. so much of our you know what i mean our, our history and our heritage is just you know what i mean uncharted you know what i mean yes, and i mean but right. we it's, it's we have no you know what i'm saying no it's it's no choice we you know what i mean we can't you know what i mean like i said we, we, we can't trace it back yeah. you know what i mean difficult man it's difficult absolutely difficult but we, but we survivors, though. We survivors. Yeah. We, we keep that's it. Pushing. it. That's all it is. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, we keep that's it pushing. So when, when, when are we looking at for the, uh, for the other side of the coin to drop? But it's, it's out. It's out. It's, oh, it's out now? Yeah, yeah, it's out. So, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. So I dropped it September the 2nd. Uh, it's been doing, doing pretty well. Uh, I've got a lot of good feedback from it. Um, um, what was I about to say? You can go to historybeforeus.com. And you can can uh, rent it or you can uh, purchase it on historybeforeus.com uh, on October the sixth or October the second. One of them. If you follow me at History Before Us on uh, social media, um, there'll be a, a short uh, screening uh, at the uh, Longleaf Film Festival, and okay. that's going to be Q and A with other artists. And another another good brother that's going to be uh, participating in that is Brother Chris Everett. 
And I don't know if you all have seen this documentary yet, but you got to see it. It's called Wilmington on Fire. And Wilmington in 1898, they burnt that junk down. And um, uh, they took over. The government took over. There was a lot of black businesses. You had white folks coming to black um, um, uh, doctors, um, dentists, all these different places. And um, it was the only coup in the um, in the country that happened. Gotcha. The government was grown, thrown over. So, bro, so, so he'll be uh, part of it as well. So, a lot of great minds and individuals that um, really are pushing this thing to 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 educate our young folks, as well as our old folks, because a lot of things I ain't know, you know, I'm still learning today, just like we all right. are. Um, right. So um, right. if you follow my right. social media, uh, History Before Us, then you'll be able to see when that is. And you can register for free and uh, and check it out. I, I want to say it's October the 6th, but don't quote me. I have to check it out. And, uh, okay. So. I'm definitely going to check it out. I'm going to go in there and, uh, and, and, and I'm going to purchase the the other Appreciate side of the coin, but the shine man, tell uh, tell the people how you know what I mean how they can reach you everywhere they can reach. You. I know historybeforeus.com. Yeah, uh, your mm -hmm. social media. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Put that so, on out there. Yep. Yeah, so social media, history before us it's on Twitter, history before us on Facebook, history before us on Instagram. Uh, email address is history before us at gmail.com. Um, and also just you know give y'all an exclusive starting October the seventeenth. Uh, we will be filming, um, starting a, a third film. I partnered up with the Black Cherokees in Oklahoma, as well as the North Carolina Black Indians uh, here in North Carolina. And uh, oh. we are doing a film based on Afro-Indigenous folks. Oh. So that's going to be uh, very, very... Oh, okay. That's, a nice, very, that's very, a nice twist. It's going to be tough, too. Yeah. People don't understand hey. how cold it has been for Afro-Indigenous folks to get the right to vote on some of these councils, these tribal councils, um, just to get recognition. <laughs> right, know, right, right, right. Um, but but the beauty is mm -hmm. the folks that we have, um, they have a great understanding of both sides of their heritage and will be able to educate folks on the trials and the tribulations, as well as how the Black Lives Matter movement is so important to their plight as well. So um, yeah, so that's that's just a sneak peek. October sixteenth, we start filming. October seventeenth, we start filming on that. So you know, I'll have a trailer out for that as well. So yeah, yeah de definitely let us know, man. Because uh, shoot us over the trailer, man. We'll put it on our page. You know what I mean? On our social media too, as well. You know, what I mean? we're all about working hand in hand, and you know what I mean, promoting. Uh, you know, what I'm saying promoting us. Absolutely. See what I'm saying? So you, you always you got a home here and another platform here too. You know what I mean? Yes, so I more than welcome and you know what I mean? We, we, in, we are in full support. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Much love. <clears throat> we wanna yeah. like I said, we wanna appreciate you, man. We wanna appreciate you. That was a you definitely enlightened us on a lot, a lot of good uh, good activity, good knowledge, good everything that we need. As our culture, man, we need to get focused on. Absolutely, uh, bro. We wanna thank uh, Frederick Deshaun Murphy, man, for coming on, man. I definitely want to set up another conversation with him as well to kind of talk about the mental health aspect of our community as well. Yes. Definitely, yeah. I definitely want to have another conversation about that one. And, hey, I, I just salute you, man, for everything you got going on, everything you're doing. It's definitely expanding the culture and keeping the movement going, man. That's all that matters. And we appreciate you for blessing us with your, your presence on this platform, man. We really do appreciate you. And yeah, likewise, brother. Likewise. Real deal. Yeah. So, family, y'all know, <clears throat> y'all can reach us at uh, BMMP Presents on YouTube, BMMP underscore ENT on Instagram, BMMP, uh, Big Money No Problems Podcasting on, on Facebook, Big Money No Problems Podcasting at gmail.com, where you can, you know what I mean, salute any, uh, submit any in inquiries, any questions, any topics, you know, feel free. You know what I mean? We welcome all uh, constructive criticism. We welcome all suggestions. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we also had BMMP underscore podcast on Twitter and all major podcast platforms. You know, yes, as I say, you know, we ain't hard to find now. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Not at all. So once again, man, we appreciate everybody for watching it tonight, man. We appreciate everybody for just staying in tune with us, man. And definitely go out there and support this man right here on this platform right now, man. Frederick Deshaun Murphy, man. Check him out. Check him out. Check him out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So as I always say, man, appreciate y'all. Salute to everybody. Hey, peace. Peace. Peace.